is one of the fears, I think, of the technical communicator, which is I have spent all this time lovingly crafting this help. Um, for these users, and I have poured my life into writing these excellent documentation files. And then is anyone actually going to read and use what I write? I think for some of us, maybe that's what keeps us up at night, or hopefully maybe you have more interesting lives and that's not what's keeping you up at night. But it certainly is a concern, and I'm here today with mostly bad news, um, unfortunately. Um, and I'm, I'm in bringing to you some of the data about user habits with reading help and then some strategies for what we can do to increase the use of our help. Um, and I'm starting with an experiment um, done in the early 2000s by um, a man named Grayling who published in Technical Communication, the STC Journal. And he summarized user attitudes as I don't want to read all of this information that you have so carefully written and designed. This is how they summarize the, their findings. Um, and what really surprised them, so they did a usability test basically to see how users engaged with the help. And what surprised them, they thought, you know, well, the users will use the product on their own, some trial and error, they'll huff and puff, and then they'll use the help and they'll be delighted that the help will help them out. So they thought it would take them a while to get to the help but then when, that they would get there eventually. But what they found instead was, what we did not expect was the extreme lengths to which our test subjects would go to avoid using the help menu. And so what they would do, they observed, is they would try to solve the problem on their own with trial and error that didn't work and they knew didn't work, and then instead of going to the help menu, they would just go back and do the same thing over again, right? The same trial and error process um, the same way to try to solve their problem. And so eventually they had to sort of goad them, the experimenters had to goad them into using the help because they wanted to see what they would do um, when they actually sort of dragged them kicking and screaming into these help files. And what they found was that users read very, very hastily. They might read two or three words and then go back, think, oh, I've got it, and then go back and try to put it into practice. So they read very hastily, um, they chose inaccurate links. So if they had a problem, they would just choose the first thing that they saw. They would choose really poorly on what kinds of links would actually help them out. And then they bailed early. This is Grayling's phrase. So again, they might spend a minute or two in there and think, okay, that's it, and then bail before they finish the tutorial, or bail before they finish reading the section that would help them out. Um, and then they didn't read product overviews very much. Um, and other surveys found that users would say that they would and then they wouldn't. We'll get more into that um, a little later. Um, they did use dialog box help. So that was kind of the one bright spot of this was that they would use dialog box help. So things like if there was a tool, um, you know, and then a little dialog box would pop up that would explain the tool and then would have a little link for additional help with the tool. They would use stuff like that. So you know, there was a, a tiny speck of hope amongst this dismal data. Um, so that was this study. Um, Another study summarized research on user help um, and attitudes towards it with these conclusions. So the reason why people don't use help is for one, it causes them anxiety, almost this physical anxiety. I think we've all felt this. I've felt this. When you have a problem, you're like, oh no. It's the same feeling you get when you realize you have to call customer service instead of just solving the problem yourself. Where you're like, oh, I can't believe I have to do this, right? It's going to be painful, right? It's like sort of the root canal feeling of using help. Um, users perceive help systems to be inadequate and often find that they are inadequate. Um, and then they contain too much information. So that really was the problem for a lot of users was they had more than they needed to solve their particular problem. So Martin and his friends, I think they're from computer science at University of Washington, they did a survey. Um, and these are really the only bright spots from the entire uh, presentation today. So this is the data you want to show your boss, right? Here's the chart you take to your boss. Um, that they found that people used that they needed help a lot. Um, that about 20% of PC users need help every day, about 24% once a week, and about 15% once a month. So you're looking at about 60% of PC users needing help. Um, at least once a month with something. I mean, they had similar data for web users and mobile users um, that showed that people do, in fact, need help frequently. Um, and so then they asked them what kinds of help they went to when they actually went for help. 
And so uh, these are a little bit of approximations. I took some data out of a chart they had because it had a lot more than we needed for today. Um, but roughly, and this I, I find this an unbelievable number, right? That 55% of users said they would use print help, um, about 50% electronic help. By far the most, uh, almost 70% said web-based content. A little less, about 63, 64 said embedded help. 58% um, said other people, and then um, by far the lowest, which again I found this surprising, about 35% electronic discussions. Um, but what this chart shows, it's a lovely chart that shows that people will actually read what we're writing, right? This is the only, the only people who found this find it. Um, so this is the bright spot in your day. This is what you can read before you go to bed <laughs> at night to make yourselves feel better. Um, and then they asked them specifically, and unfortunately Sheila Knight won't be here today to talk about embedded oh. help. Um, but one of the findings was that embedded help is very useful. Um, and so people would use a lot of different types of embedded help, particularly like a quick reference guide. Uh, users tend to really like indexes. That's one of the findings across the board was that they preferred indexes to a table of contents. Um, they liked that quite a bit better. Um, so a lot of them would use search. That's another common finding is that users really like search functions, especially when they're good search functions. Um, if they're bad search functions, it makes them angry. Um, not a lot use a glossary. I think that we're familiar with that from focus is more on task-based help rather than system-centered help. Um, and balloon help is also popular. Um, that finding came up in a few studies as well. So um, this is a bright spot of news, right? This is helpful, hopeful news. Um, other news is not so good. So we think, we know that users use help less than we think they do. What this uh, other study found it was an observation of users where they interviewed them about their help use and then observed them at work. And what they found is that users use help less than they think they do, um, which is the really disturbing piece of data. So the, um, I guess the colors are a little hard to differentiate between here, but the uh, diamonds were the interviews of what the users said they would do, and the squares are what the users actually did during 22 hours of workplace observations. So they said they used online help and asked other people a lot, but you can see they didn't really. They used uh, online help only about 5.3% of the time. Um, that uh, dismal print uh, square right there, right at zero, um, is a little depressing, right? They said they would use it, um, but then they really didn't. Um, what they really did was a lot of work around in trial and error, just trying to solve their problem um, themselves. So sadly, even users think they uh, use help more than they do. And this is true, and this is why I'm a little skeptical of some of the survey data, is because people always lie in surveys, um, either because they want to sound good or because they just were very bad as humans about understanding what we actually do. Um, another workplace observation is just as dismal. Um, a scholar named Joanne Hackos conducted 14 worksite observations, observed no one using help <laughs> of any kind. Um, and again, you know, that's not, we're not following these people uh, 24 hours a day. It doesn't mean that no one was using help, but it certainly means they're not busting the help manual out left and right. Um, and then, of course, the other finding that's emerged recently is that users greatly prefer Google and other search engines over um, authored help. And so this is from the Martin study again, that users prefer to use web-based help content like frequently asked questions or technical support archives more so than using product manuals or the help system embedded within an application. Mm. Another study found the same thing. So this is a um, poll of uh, college students about the kinds of help that they use, and this is a one to seven uh, Likert scale. And so you can see the user help there, uh, on a one to seven scale, the average was people said that they were 3.5 to, you know, as far as how likely they were to use it. Um, and how satisfied they were was the 3.53, right? So not a lot of people likely to use it and not a lot of satisfaction within that use. Comparatively, internet searches, people said on a one to seven scale, the average was that they were 5.23, you know, they, they were much more likely to use it and much, much more satisfied with using um, help that they had found via Google or other search engines. All right, so that's all the bad news. Right? But we can't just, you know, the conference is over, let's all go home. <laughs> no one is reading what we do. That can't be the conclusion. We still have seven panels left today. Um, so what can we do about this problem? All right, so one of the things is that these scholars suggest some ways that help can be improved. 
Um, and so I wanted to look at that. Um, a guy who does a lot of usability studies named Spool found that users will use some help. Um, and his data is really robust. It's from the late 90s, so it's a little old, the data that I was looking at. Um, but he's looking at you know, thousands and thousands of users for companies. And he found users will use self-contained tutorials. In general, the other people found that they didn't like tutorials very much, that users didn't. Um, but this uh, research found that they will, and that they like buttons that are labeled, say, hints or tips. Right? Um, so things that you can just click, I don't know how to do this, here's a tip. Um, Grayling did a follow-up study to his depressing study, which is called Fear and Loathing of the User Help Menu, by the way. Um, and he found that users will use embedded help. So they did another study with 10 users, and they didn't even tell them it was a study of user help. They just said, we want you to test out this new product, uh, this new software package. And so then they watched them do it, and every single user use the embedded help at some point during learning the new software package without prompting. And the really good news out of this test is that none of them closed it, right? So they opened it, they had seven tasks, and their task three was particularly challenging, and so that's when most of them would use the help. But then none of them shut it down later. They all left it open, um, which I think is a very hopeful piece of news. Um, and then based on his research, Grayling recommends five uh, qualities of good user help that you can use as a test, you know, yes, no, for each of these things. So, is it context specific? Is it easily available and obvious to invoke? Is it useful and is it non-intrusive? So I think a good example off the top of our heads of help that meets this criteria is when you're filling out the credit card um, thing to buy something and it has the little, it asks you for the security code and then there's the what is this right next to that, I think meets all of these criteria, right? Because it's specific to that circumstance, right? You only need it when you have to put your uh, little security code in. It's easily available, it's right there, it's obvious to invoke, you just click on it. Um, it's useful because it tells you where to find the information you're looking for, and it's non-intrusive because if you know it's not in your way at all, you can completely ignore it, right? In contrast, I think an example of help that meets none of these qualities, except maybe the context specific, was that paper clip that Microsoft Office retired years ago, <laughs> Clippy, right? You would, would start writing a letter and everyone in the world knows how to write a letter and he would pop up with his little eyes and eyebrows and say, looks like you're writing a letter, right? And like, I don't need, he's very intrusive, right? I don't need Clippy's help to write a letter to my grandma, right? So these are the five um, pieces of, uh, five criteria that you can sort of use um, and Grayling would then do usability testing if they didn't know, say, is this too intrusive? or not obvious enough. The other solution, I think, is staring us in the face. And all of these scholars, no one suggested this, and all of these scholars are like, what are we going to do, what are we going to do, what are we going to do? And it's staring us in the face. Put your help on Google, right? If people can find it on Google, they'll use it, right? I mean, that's what our, these findings are suggesting. They like web searches. If they can Google help and find your help, they'll read it, and they'll use it. Right, so as a few examples, I ran some Google searches. So the other day I needed to learn how to resize a layer in Photoshop. I was Photoshopping a picture of my dog so that it looked like she was in Jurassic Park, right? which is an important thing to do. Um, <laughs> Jurassic Park, right? Um, and so I didn't know how to resize a layer. And so I Googled how do I resize a layer in Photoshop. And then none of these answers are from Adobe. right? And I didn't use any Adobe answers. I just used the first thing that came up that helped me. I went on with my important project, right? And, but for the purposes of this uh, little test, I went into the next page on Google and you can get the Adobe um, forums. And that we'll talk about it, but that's user generated. I could not find Adobe's answer to this question that wasn't user generated, right? Before I gave up, say, three or four screens in, which is much further than any user would go. All right, in contrast, so I, this one was just a test um, for me, I was trying to use some natural language. So assume a user Googled, they wanted to put a bunch of addresses into one letter. We know this is mail merge, but they may not know that that's the term, right? And that's what's important about this, is they may not know the terminology, that's why they're Googling it. So I tried what I guessed might be a natural language search of put several addresses into the same Word document. And one, two, three, four. First four hits are Microsoft's. And the fourth one, they figured out what I wanted. Right, just by me asking a question that wasn't really very clear, Microsoft got it, and there's my answer right there. 
Um, in contrast, yesterday I was working with Skype. Um, so another example, a positive example, because we're Skyping someone in today. Um, and my volume wasn't working, so I Googled can't hear the other person on Skype. Boom, number one, Skype support, right, came up. Um, and then it had a little thing where I could click and run the wizard and it would fix it, all of this stuff, right? And so if our help is on Google, and this may not be relevant to everyone, but if our help is on Google, people will read it. I think one of the big paradigm shifts with the internet is people don't care if the help is coming from you or if it's coming from a 12 year old, right? As long as it works, it just, it doesn't matter, right? Um, so I came up with a few um, strategies for SEO. I am not an SEO professional. Um, people who are, like, they get dump trucks full of money driven up to their house every year and they just pour it on the lawn, right? <laughs> SEO is search engine optimization, right? Um, so I do not know um, all of the ins and outs of search engine optimization. And it's very tricky. Google guards its formulas very carefully for how it determines who ends up at the top of the page. Um, and they're doing more and more changes to stop people from gaming the system because that became popular for a while, trying to sort of trick Google into thinking you were more popular than you were. Um, but there are some strategies that will work, um, or hopefully will work, to help your help end up towards the top of a Google search. So the first thing I recommend is just Googling common help questions that you get to see what comes up, right? Does your help come up? Does someone else's help come up? And you can coordinate, say, with customer service. What kinds of queries do you get all of the time? Or you may know what the particular challenge points are from your software. And then so you responding to this by you're Googling sort of natural language user terminology questions. How would the user phrase this question? And then you're using that in your help, which I think is something that all of us like to do. Um, if you use software where people talk about it in forums, look at how they talk about it. So when they're asking each other questions, I don't know how to do this. Um, can you tell me how to do this? Um, what kinds of language are they using um, when they're talking about it? Um, you want to use keywords and especially, so you want to figure out what your keywords are that people are going to search, right? And once you've gotten those figured out, and you can use something called Google AdWords to help you figure that out. Um, uh, and if you use keywords, especially in your URL, right, in the titles of your pages, in your H1 headers, and then in your links, those are the things that Google looks at particularly to determine, well, this is important. It ranks things differently, so it calculates this, those elements as being the most indicative of what the page is about. Um, you can use meta tags on your site. I'm not particularly familiar with this, but this is hidden code that Google can see that it will read, and so it may give you keywords, right, and then it'll, you can put keywords in that Google will read and say, oh, this must be about HTML, right, so I'm going to show this as a result for HTML. Um, more recently, people have found that if you update things frequently, that Google likes that. It likes things that are updated frequently more than things that say, you know, it's still from 1997. Um, and then the last thing that it really seems to be factoring in recently is um, so what uh, some SEO people call social signaling or social votes, which in other words is people sharing your stuff. So Google takes other people's recommendations very seriously. So if you tweet something and someone else retweets it, Google takes that as a vote, right, um, that considers that to mean that someone likes your content, right? So the more that people share your stuff, the more Google says, well, everyone's sharing this. This must be good content or interesting content. Um, and so you can do things like, say, if you release um, some new help on your website, you know, you can have buttons, social media buttons that allow people to share it, or you can tweet um, if you have a Twitter account that says, you know, we've released some new help. Um, again, so it allows people to share it and sort of cast their vote um, for your help um, that will help you rise up um, in the Google rankings. I also recommend if you have the time and you, um, work with a software that people ask a lot of questions about, say, in Yahoo Answers, um, you can point people, and I don't see anything wrong with pointing people in Yahoo Answers to your help, right? So someone asked a question, you know, here's a link here for this, um, so that they can find the content that you've created as well. Um, so these are a few strategies, hopefully, to help us at least not be too depressed about the fact that people may not be needing our help very often, um, and hopefully that we'll get your help read even more. Thank you. And then I guess we'll do Q&A.